let's pray together. Father, we bless your name and we thank you for this time of worship to you through praise and worship. And now, Lord, we send up praises to you, our outward public display to say how much we love you and to say we ain't ashamed. You weren't ashamed to take our sins to the cross and we're not ashamed to let the whole world know that you are God and there is no other. And now, Lord, we need to hear a word come down from heaven to earth. So as we open up the scriptures this morning, open our eyes that we can really see you better, open our ears that we can hear you better, and open our hearts that we may be receptive to this gospel message. We bless you and thank you already for what you're going to say and what you're going to do. In the name of Jesus the Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and our King soon to come. Hallelujah and amen. God bless you. From the book of Romans, New Testament book of Romans, chapter number 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and in particular, chapter 8 is probably my favorite book of the Bible and probably one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. There's a whole lot that you could preach on for a whole year here. But we're going to pick out one scripture that will bless us today, I pray. And I hope you're listening and paying attention because, man, this is going to bless you real good. Chapter 8, one verse here, verse 28. And we know. Tell somebody we know. There's just some stuff in life you ought to know. (laughs) And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Those who are called according to his purpose. And, and, And our title is right there in the scripture. All things work together for our good. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, all things work together. For our good. Oh, you ought to give God praise already for what he's going to say as you take your seats. God created us for one reason only, y'all. To know him, to love him, and to glorify him. The praise team just stopped playing. But what they were doing was leading us in praise. Uh, our, our praise team singers were leading us in praise. You can't understand the word of God without some praise too. If, if you uh, praise, real praise, genuine praise can only be done by believers. You can sing the songs. You can read the words on the page. You can even get with the melody and the lyrics, but you don't understand, and your praise doesn't go past the ceiling unless you really know Jesus. So when we come to church, there's two parts. The first part is you sending praises up to him, telling him how awesome he is and how much you appreciate him keeping you alive one more week. The second part is what we're doing now, when the ministry comes down from heaven to earth. So we send up praises, now he sends down understanding and blessing. Amen? And he's going to tell us today that all things work together, the praise and the preaching, for our good and for his glory. Am I right about it? There's just some stuff you ought to know. You ever notice when somebody gets their head hurt playing a football game, uh, uh, they, they're laid out for a while, and the coaches and everybody run to the field. And they're talking to the guy who got knocked out, and they're saying, okay. So they try to ask him some basic stuff that he ought to know. What's your name? <laughs> How many fingers am I holding up? What city are we in? You ought to just know. And if you can't tell them that, they need to take you off the field, and you can't play no more today. Yeah. There's some, some stuff you ought to know. Yeah. Am I right about it? So God is trying to help you and I understand in this passage of scripture, we stopped in the middle and just pulled out verse 28, but we're going to try to make it make sense. God created all of us, y'all, with a free will. Somebody say free will. 
That means you have a choice to make. Let me explain free will real quickly. Free will is this. When your parents tell you, go wash the dishes, you have the free will to either go wash the dishes or not. But there's a penalty for one or the other. Wash the dishes, blessings. Don't wash the dishes, not so good. We have free will. Brother Robert at the stoplight, free will. I'm going to stop or I'm going to run through it. Free will. One will get you stopped. The other one will get you stopped too, but you get a ticket with that stop. Free will. Satan told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, in the, in the Garden of Eden, uh, that, that God knew that if they ate the fruit, they would be just like God, and, and they were deceived by Satan. And they had a choice. We're either going to listen to God or we're going to listen to Satan. And we know how that turned out. So we live in a world now that's dominated by sin because we made bad choices and our free will. Animals don't get free will. If you look at a giraffe, he can only be a giraffe. If you look at a, at, at a beaver, he can only be a beaver. A cat can only be a cat. But you and I have the choice whether we're going to obey or disobey. But listen, listen, even though we messed up a long time ago in the Garden of Eden, and it's been passed on to all generations, including ours, we still are loved by God. Now, you need to take that home today. Tell somebody next to you, guess what? God still loves you. God loves us past our crazy, past our stupid, past our ins insensitivities, past our anger and frustrations and disappointments. God still loves us, but he loves us too much to leave us like that. He saves us and brings us into the church as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us as we are. So he's always, every Sunday, every week, transforming us to look more like him because in order for us to enter heaven we got to be heaven worthy and some of us we still got a lot of work to be done I know this guy right here God's still working on me amen do I have a witness in the house God is still working on me brother Mike I'm glad I'm not where I used to be but I'm not where I need to be but God's grace and God's mercy is ushering me to where I need to be even though we sin, God's grace still abounds. That means God sees our mess-ups and loves us anyhow. God works personally with every individual, like you're the only person on earth, for his purpose. And his purpose is not for you to get stuff that you want. His purpose is not to make you happy. His purpose is to make you holy so you can be with him. God is holy, and he wants you to be holy too. Naturally, the way we were born through Adam and Eve, naturally, they were holy. Then they made a bad choice, and now they fell from their holiness. So the rest of our time and the rest of the reading of Scripture, from Genesis all the way to the end of the Bible to Revelation, is to get us right. He's spending a whole lot of time trying to get us right. We must really need some work. But thank God for his grace and for his mercy. Am I right about it? God is trying to get us right, y'all. Committing ourselves to live for him and transforming ourselves. And listen, we don't live for ourselves. God is using your life with all its pluses and minuses, with all the good and the bad we've done, to point people to him. That's our job. He calls all of it. So don't come at me and say, well, Pastor, that ain't my personality. I don't like to talk a lot about religion and God. I, I just try to live it in front of everybody so they'll know that I'm a Christian. They don't know you're a Christian. They just know you're quiet. The scripture says, be ready always to give a reason for the hope that is in you. That means somewhere along the line, you need to open your mouth and tell them you need to come to Jesus. Open your mouth and tell them, you need to find a church home, come with me to Skybridge Community Church. You need to open your mouth and tell them the hope that's in you comes from Christ. There's a story about Linda and I were watching the news the other night, and there's a young boy, five-year-old boy, who developed kidney cancer. 
His name is Grayson. And Grayson had to have a port put in so that he could get chemotherapy. Five years old. And to get through the whole process, because it's so, cancer is just mean. And it's scary and it's frustrating to get poked and prodded and get these drugs put in you to make you lose your hair and you get weak and you get tired. And so in order to encourage Grayson, somebody made him a Spider-Man costume. So he walked around flying through the hospital with his Spider-Man costume. And then he was so encouraged by the costume that other people sent him other stuff. They got Batman and Superman and all this. But his life. It's not what his, he wanted. It's not what his mom and dad wanted. For, you don't want your child born with cancer. But the Spider-Man costume encouraged all the other kids. And he would go from room to room to room and catch other kids going down the hallway and they'd go like, oh, Spider-Man. And of course, other kids would go like, that's so cool. So his life right. is and encouragement to other people. Question for you. Have you put on your Spider-Man costume yet? Are you an encouragement to everybody else, or are you just another person walking down the hallway? Do they know that you're a believer? Do you share your faith? A lot of people ask me, why do I wear crazy socks? I wear crazy socks because I'm crazy. These are my... Jesus socks. Because see, when you look at my crazy socks, it makes you ask, hey man, um, those are kind of loud socks you got going on there, bro. You couldn't find nothing to match? No, it's to make you ask me. So I can give you a reason for the hope that's in me. Ah! 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 You, you, you see? You see? It's done intentionally. I want you to talk to me about Jesus. Because I only got one life to live, and I'm already closer to the end than I am to the beginning. Right. I don't have much time left, so I want to tell Jesus. I told as many people as I could before I got here. See, God's not going to measure me by my job, by my income, by my, by my certificates on the wall, by my, by my having a swimming pool, by my being able to fly around the world. He don't care. <laughs> but did you tell somebody, did you give somebody hope? Did you help somebody a little bit better like, like Grayson? So what is God doing with your life? Hmm. Are you sharing light and impact like Grayson? Grayson's got cancer, and he's making the news. You're whole, and you ain't doing nothing. You just get up, go to work, punch the ticket, go home, get up, go to work. What difference does your life make unless you are letting your light of Christ shine through you? All things work together for good. Background. So how do we get here? What's the context of the text? In other words, we pull out verse 28. But that's kind of funny. You got to be careful when you preach. You can't just pull out a verse and make it make sense unless you understand the context of all the surrounding scripture. Why is the Apostle Paul talking to us in Romans chapter 8? What's so special about Romans? And what's so special about chapter 8? And what's so special about verse 28? Most one of the most quoted scriptures is verse 28 of Romans. Everybody likes to hear that. Especially when you go through a difficult time, your friends will talk to you on the phone and say, girl, I pray for you. Oh, man, I didn't know you were going through stuff like that. Bro, I'm praying for you. And then they'll quote to you. Well, guess what, man? I know you're going through, but guess what? All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Good quote, good scripture, but what does it mean? What does it mean? The Apostle Paul is showing us how human beings uh, 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 lack God's righteousness because of our sin in verses 1 through 3. We receive God's righteousness when God justifies us, verses 4 and chapters 4 and 5. He demonstrates God's righteousness and, 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 and how we are rebels instead of followers in chapters 6 through 8. He confirms Jesus' righteousness or God's righteousness uh, to the Jews in chapters 9 through 11. And he applies God's righteousness in practical ways in chapters 12 through 16. So everything I've told you so far is about God's righteousness. 
God is holy and righteous. We're not. So we need his righteousness to live right. You can't live a godly Christian life. It's one thing to say, I accepted Jesus, I got baptized, and now I'm a Christian. Now what? Well, now you got to grow. Say grow. grow. It's, see, too many of us are still in first grade because we only come to church when it's convenient. We only come to church when it's comfortable. We only come to church every now and then, and then we skip it again. And you don't understand why you still don't understand God. And you don't understand your purpose. Your purpose is to point everybody you know to God. And in particular, through Jesus Christ. That's why we have the cross. That's why we have the cross. Have you told anybody about Jesus? I get this all the time. Well, I don't talk about the Bible and Jesus because I don't know enough. That's because you're not growing. We have church every Sunday here, not just today, every Sunday at 930. We have Bible study every Wednesday at 630 so that you can grow. Here you go. A few people on this side have grown, not so much on this side. You see, you're already not passing the test. You're still staring at me going like, huh? So we're here to make sure that everybody today can Ah, there we go. All right, now we can go to second grade. So all things work together for our good. Let me give you six things you need to take home. Now, in front of you, for if you're our guest today, there are some pink notepads. I recommend you take that notepad and write down these six bullet points. Uh, just take a pad out and start writing. You got a pen. I'm going to give you six things to take home. The first thing I want you to understand is the peace of knowing God. The peace of knowing God. We've been through enough crazy for the last three years. Am I right about it? Anybody familiar with the term COVID-19? Everybody, let me see your hands if you know what I'm talking about. COVID-19? Yeah, man, that put us into a, uh, into a crazy period of time. No work, no school, no, no going to the grocery store, no mall, no movies. COVID-19 took away our peace. We're all nervous. Do I get the vaccine? Do I not get the vaccine? People are fighting about it in our houses, and our churches, and our businesses. I ain't getting the vaccine. Well, I'm getting the vaccine. Why? No peace. So first thing you need to understand is the peace of knowing God. You don't have any peace. You don't know if you're going to go to heaven or hell. You don't know if you're going to make it if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we know that for those who have loved God, all things work together for, for good for those who are called according to his purpose. There's a sense of security in knowing. There's a story about a, a man who went to work and he left his cell phone at home. That's one of the worst things you can do. He left his cell phone at home and while he's at work, his boss comes to him and let him know, hey, man, I need you to work an extra couple of hours today. So he didn't have his cell phone, and he just kept working, and he didn't text his wife, hey, babe, I'm going to be a little late today. So she's at home worried about him because he ain't called, he ain't shown up. It's past the time he normally comes home. And so finally when the door opens and he walks in, there's a sigh of relief on her part because he's home and he's safe. And everything's okay. And he's trying to tell her, I, I, I didn't get a chance to talk to you. You see what happens? The peace occurs when we see that everybody's whole and happy. But when we don't see, and when things are not working out according to our best interests, we start worrying and stressing out. Knowing brings comfort. Knowing brings peace. Paul did not say, we think or we hope. He says, we know. We know he's referencing early parts of the scripture. What do we know? In order to get down to verse 28, let's go back up to verse number one. Let's go to the top of chapter 28. The, I'll give them to you, uh, and, and you don't have to write them all down. Just go back and, and look at this video again online. From the J.B. Phillips uh, uh, interpretation of this text, it says this, verses one and two. We know that no condemnation now hangs over the heads of those who believe in Christ. In other words, everybody who believes in Jesus Christ have accepted him into their heart, have been baptized. We know we're going to go to heaven. That's cool right there. Verses three and four. We know that the law never succeeded in producing righteousness, but Jesus Christ did. We know in verses 9 and 10 that if Christ 
does live within you, his presence means that your sins, your sin nature is dead and your spirit is alive because of his righteousness that lives inside of you. In other words, the way we are naturally born, we are all born on the way to hell. All of us, everybody. Everybody you know, every black person, white person, Latino person, Asian person, everybody is on their way to hell. The only ones that don't go to hell are the ones who come to Jesus, accept him as their Lord and their Savior. That means he's our master and our rescuer. If you've ever fallen into some water and you can't swim, you need a rescuer. You need a lifeguard. Even if you can swim and we drop you in the Atlantic Ocean, you need somebody to come rescue you. You can only tread water so long. You need somebody to come rescue you. Jesus is our rescuer. He rescues us from our sinful condition. We need Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. Amen? But we know that we've been rescued because we said yes to the lifeguard when he came up to you. Do you want me to save you or not? No, just let me drown. Really, that's what we say when we don't accept Jesus. But when we say yes to him, he says, okay, now I am your Lord. I am your rescuer. I'm going to rescue. I'm going to bring you in. We know in verse 13 that the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. Wait a minute. You're telling me that the same God who was able to raise somebody from the dead, raise Jesus from the dead, that same God, that same power, now lives inside of me, a believer? Yes! That's the kind of power. You got that Spider-Man stuff. You got that Superman stuff. You got that cape flapping in the back. You can jump single, uh, a tall building in a single bound. You got power inside of you because of what God has done for you. We know in verse 14 that all who follow the leading of the Spirit are the sons of God. You and I are sons of God, not daughters, sons, because in the Bible, the sons get the best part. And the oldest son gets even the best part. Guess what? Based on what Jesus did for us, we're all equivalent to the oldest son in the Old Testament reading. We know in verse 18 that our present sufferings, the, the heartache, the pain, the death, the sickness, the frustrations, uh, the job layoffs, everything that bad that happens to us, we know that it's nothing compared to what God is going to have in plan for us when we get to heaven with him. Because he has it all planned out for us. We know in verse 19 that you have been adopted into the family of God. Did you know that we are all adoptees? We are all adoptees. We've all been adopted. When Jesus died for our sins on the cross, we were all sinners. But now we've been adopted, taken from that situation. We've been taken out of the foster system and brought into a family of God. And he says, you are mine now. All of you are mine. You got a name now. You're not just somebody. You here? You're important. Ah, and we know, verse 22, that, 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 that at this present time, uh, although life is going through pains and groans, even the universe is groaning. That's why we have tornadoes. That's why we have earthquakes. That's why we have floods. All of creation is groaning because sin has messed up the planet. We know in verse 23 and 24 that all these things are happening and that mankind and creation itself is almost like on its tippy toes trying to see what God's going to do next. We know in verses 20, 26 that we have hope for something better that we can't see right now, but we have to settle down and wait for it to come because God is sending it because we already know what he can do. From verse 1 down to verse 26 leads to our verse today. Verse 28, for we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. All things. That's the peace of knowing God. When you know that he did all of that for you and me to get to verse 28, that's the peace. If you don't have nothing else when you leave today, you ought to have some peace in your heart. Say, you know what? I can go to sleep at night and not stress and worry because even my pains and heartaches, even my past, 
even my, my craziness, God says, I still love you, and I still got a plan for your life. And you can't even mess it up. All things work together for our good. All things work together for good. The peace of knowing God. Secondly, the person we love is God. Ah! The person we love is God. What do you mean by that, Reverend? Well, here it is. It's right here in the text. It says, for those. Now, here it is. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God. For unbelievers who people who don't believe in Jesus Christ and don't love him, this, is, this promise doesn't work for them. They don't get nothing. I know that's not good English, but it preaches well. If you don't know, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you get nothing. That's like Christmas time. Everybody show up and you get these gifts around the Christmas tree. And believers are going to go open up a box and they're going to find salvation and justification and glorification. And they know that they're going to be in heaven with God and all these great things. Unbelievers are going to go to the Christmas tree and open their gifts. They're going to find, I got rocks. I got a box of rocks. Yep, and that's about all you're going to get. Unless you know Jesus Christ. The promise is for God's children who have been adopted. But if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you just play in religion, if you just play in church, if you don't ever want to worship God and serve God and learn from God and grow in God, he says, you probably are not mine. You just go, you, you have a religious experience. But you don't really know me as your daddy. You, you're not, you, you haven't allowed me to adopt you. You won't let me adopt you. I keep asking you, come on in, let me adopt you. You keep saying, oh, I'll come one day when, when I get myself together. You never get yourself together. If we could get ourselves together, we wouldn't need a rescuer. That's like saying, I need a lifeguard after I save myself from drowning. Okay, true story, but don't y'all tell nobody, all right? Don't y'all tell nobody. Only, only some close friends know about this. So I had to learn how to swim because people were having a good time swimming way back when I was like 12, 13. And I still didn't know how to swim at that time, but I was in Boy Scout. And the Boy Scout you told you how to swim. They say, go down to like knee deep water and then over and put your face in the water and look around. You know, okay, that's pretty cool. Then eventually have you go up to waist deep water. Do the same thing. Then after a while they said, over time, over time, you do that for a few weeks. And then over time you go to neck water. And you just barely kind of almost tread in the water, but not quite. And you, you're there and you're just moving around. And it says, okay, now you're ready to, to you know, go off the diving board. So here I go. I said, okay, well, I did that page. I already did that page. I, said, I look over at the diving board. I said, well, all right, here we go. Go to the diving board. All the other kids, they're jumping off. And they were swimming and go to the side and get out and go back around. I said, man, this is it. This is what I've been wanting to do. This is great. And up there, I said, man, and nobody there, no friends, because I didn't want people to know I couldn't swim. I, I, mom and dad are not there. My siblings are not there. Nobody that I knew was there. Because I was embarrassed. I didn't want them to know I can't swim. But I'm going to swim today. I'm going to swim today. I go over to the diving board. I jump in. I go straight down. I'm like. <gasps> and I'm, I'm splashing around in the lifeguard. I look over at him like, dude. But he won't come in. So I'm just splashing my way, because I already had learned how to dog pedal, but I, I kind of would push off the bottom. There's no bottom. It's like 12 feet down. I pedal, I dog pedal all the way to the edge, and I grab the side. I said, I ain't ever getting in the water again. I almost died. I needed a rescuer. God must have had special grace on me that day. He must have looked down there and the angel says, he's doing it again. You want us to go get him? No, I already got grace. I already, uh, and I, 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 I finally dog paddled to the edge, and I went down to the children's pool. Big old 13-year-old with three years down there. I'm just splashing, man. I'm having a ball. These three years down there. Ain't you kind of big to be over here with us? Yeah, but you don't know what I've been through. <laughs> 
Not today, brother, not today. You ain't getting rid of me today. I'm going to be right here with y'all all afternoon. The person we love is God because God loved us. He rescues us from our crazy situation. Have you ever done crazy in life, just stupid stuff that you say, God, if it had not been for the grace of God, I'd still be there? We ought to all just be thinking, God say, hallelujah, hallelujah. Because we've been through stupid. I, I got to quit using that word and find something else. But my goodness. Ah, thank God that he loves us so much. The peace of God, the person we love is God. Uh, 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 why do we love God so much? Because he gives us this promise. But let me give you a couple of promises he gives us. Here's five real quick promises. God's presence. He promises, I will never leave you in, in Hebrews 13, 5. He promises his protection. I, I am your shield in Genesis 15, 1. He says, uh, God's power. I will strengthen you in Isaiah 41, 10. God's provision. I will help you in Isaiah 41, 10. God's purpose. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not evil in Jeremiah 20 and 11. God gives us promises throughout Scripture. And this verse 28 is a promise that only believers get to be blessed by. All things work together for our good if we're part of God's family. All things mean the good that we have done and the bad that we have done. You say, that don't make good sense. Let me make it plain for you. Um, this past holiday season, my family all got together at one of my sister's houses, and everybody brought stuff, desserts and cakes and pies and, and food. One of the things, uh, my older sister, she's not here today, Sylvia, she made these really good sugar cookies. When I looked up the ingredients for sugar cookies, it says baking powder, flour, eggs, and on and on and on and on. None of that sounds good by itself. You don't go to the kitchen normally and just go get a spoonful of baking powder and go. You don't, you don't go, you don't go, you don't, you don't go to, the, to the refrigerator and get a raw egg and just crack it in the glass and say, ah, raw eggs, and you throw it down. No! None of that by itself is good. But all things mixed together make sugar cookies. It makes a dough. And then God's got to heat it up. You ain't listening to me, Reverend. You ain't listening. You ain't listening, man. I'm trying to tell you. None of that by itself. The good that we do and the bad that we do, somehow God mixes it up. The baking powder and the flour and the eggs and the sugar. And then he ain't done with us yet. He put a little heat under us pressure under us to make us conform, change. We ain't the same no more. Put us in the oven. Check it out. It ain't ready yet. She ain't ready. She's still acting a fool. Leave her in there a little bit longer. Because the direction said for 10 minutes, if I pull you out in five, you're still crazy. So I'll leave her in there a little longer. Now it's time to take you out. And now we got sugar cookies. Somebody ought to be glad that God mixed us together with the good and the bad that we've done and uses us to make sugar cookies. Ah! Ah! And if you do it right, you add a little bit of milk on the side, a little milk and cookies. Ah! God, the promises of God, the promises of God. Number three, number three, the promise of God. God is the object of this text. You don't get through verse 28 without dealing with God because God is the whole purpose that we're talking about this. It's all about God. But uh, 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 it, through, through his promises, he accomplishes his will and our growth when we obey his promises. The promise is only good if you believe it. And the one who gives the promise is qualified because he makes you. He named you. He called you. He adopted you. So he gets to make the promises. And his history tells us that his promises are true. But his promises are only good as the person making it. God is not a man that he should lie. 
Numbers 23 and 19. It's not a coincidence, listen, that the situation occurs uh, in, in our lives and in a particular place, at a particular time, God will send people into our lives to help us as well. He will do miraculous things, but he often works through other people. He often works through other people. Let me explain. We had an event here at the church in the parking lot. And I can't remember, I think it was one of those Sunday fun day events or something, and we were cleaning up and finishing up, and a man shows up. We didn't know him. But the man was a real thin guy. He was sweaty, it was hot, and we gave him a bottle of water. But he needed more than a bottle of water. He had bandages on his arms where he looked like he had been in a hospital. And he seemed that he left AMA. That means against medical advice. In other words, he left before the doctors told him to go home. And now he's sick and he's weak. But I believe that what God is doing, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So if we are those people here at the Skybridge Church in the parking lot, here's a man who walks up to us and gives us a chance to show our faith. We can either ignore him and say, well, go somewhere else, man. We don't want to be bothered with you. You don't smell good. You don't look good. You, 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 you're weak. You're sweaty. Uh, you know, go die somewhere else, but don't die here. So we called EMS, and he says, you didn't call EMS, did you? We said, yeah, we did, man, because we've done all we can do to help you, but you need more help. EMS got here, and he kind of fought with them. He said, I'm not going to get in that thing. I'm not going to get So I had to walk back over to the stretcher and talk to him. I said, hey, dude, we're trying to help you. Get in that stretcher. And he did, and they took him away. Well, Re Reverend, what does that have to do with the sermon? See, we were having a good celebration of Sunday fun day or whatever day we were celebrating. But in the mix of all that, God added some mixture to our cookie dough oh, yeah. to see if we still can make cookies. We couldn't. We can't make it good. But God said, I took his situation and y'all's proclamation that we are here serving God. Now, let's see what service looks like. You can talk a good game all day long, but can you play in the game? Are you willing to help somebody that don't look like you? Are you willing to help immigrants who come across the border who are hungry and tired and, and been beat up in life? Or are you ready to kick them to the curb and say, hey, they're not our responsibility. We don't want to talk to them. God helped everybody. And he started with the poor. He started with the poor. And he hung out with the poor. Because the rich were too snobby and full of themselves. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. All things. The peace of knowing God. The person we love is God. The promises of God. Number four, the production of God. In other words, the work of God. God does the work of saving us. We just say yes or no. He does the work of redeeming us. Sometimes we forget God is working right in our face. And other times he's working behind the scenes to fix our situation, to fix our lives, to help us control our temper. Don't you know that God controls times and seasons? God controls the wind and the waves. If God can control nature and tell nature, stop, sit down, and tell the wind, stop blowing, then surely he can take our little situation. God is playing chess while you and I are just still playing checkers. Proverbs says this in Proverbs 3.11. He says, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, his son and, that he delights in. So sometimes when we go through heartache, sometimes, it's to correct us because we've gotten so off track. His children, we don't act like believers. All things, everybody say all things, work together for our good. Number five, the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. Consider Romans 8.28 is one of the most amazing promises in all of the Bible. Here all means all. All things work together. All things work together. God works all things when you and I do them right. And, and, and when we do them wrong, he still blends it in there and makes good cookies anyhow. God says, y'all don't scare me. 
You know, you may intimidate some people in your house. You may intimidate some people if you're in a gang or if you're in politics and you try to hold something over another political person in, 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 in the White House or in Congress. God says, y'all don't scare me because I can take y'all out anytime I want. I choose to keep you here and use you to show that even people like us who are corrupt and bad and evil can be converted by the power of God. God works all things for our good means all, all. Lastly, number six, the plan of God, the plan of God. The last words in this part is for our good, good. Everybody say good. good. Whenever God works in our lives, he is inherently working for our best interest. He loves us. He cares about us. He died for us. He made us in his image, and he wants us to live for our good, but more importantly, for his glory. So he puts things in place for our glory. The believer uh, uh, never needs to worry or suffer over difficulties and trials. Now listen, we all go through problems. We all go through our car breaks down, the hot water heater stops working, the kids get expelled from school, the spouse is acting crazy, the job is laying off people, and on and on. It's craziness everywhere. But don't mistake, don't mistake a heartache for God not loving you. That's part of the problem. We were born on a planet called Earth. We were born as sinners. We are saved by the grace of God. Somebody say grace. We are saved by the grace of God. Guess it. Grace is something you get, but you don't deserve it. Uh, let, let me give you an example real quick. I got stopped once or more uh, by, by the police. What? What? I got stopped by the police once, and he pulled me over. Sir, did you know I clocked you doing 75 in a 60? I just happened to be leaving the hospital, so I had my white lab coat on and my greens on. So he looked at me. He said, sir, what are you doing? I said, man, I, we've been in surgery all night. I'm tired. I, I'm just going home. I'm just tired. He says, sir, I'm going to give you a break. But, sir, you need to slow down. You're going you're gonna to injure yourself, and you won't be able to go back to the hospital and do surgery anymore. I said, oh, man, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I said, God bless you, man. I appreciate it. And I said, to God, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> he didn't give me a warning. I drive off. That's grace. Because yeah. yeah. by the way, I should have got that ticket. Yeah. Because I, it was one of those, Paul, it was one of those unmarked police cars. And in the unmarked police cars, you don't see the thing that says sanitary or police department. All of a sudden, you just, this guy is right up on me, and so there's no dome lights either. So he's just up on me. I'm going like, this dude. So I changed lanes. He changed lanes. I changed lanes again. He changed lanes. I said, dude, I'm trying to let you go. I, I changed lanes again. I said, oh. <laughs> and so I pulled up a little bit more, and then I could see the lights in his grill going, Ah, this is not going to be a good day, because I know I was, I was tired. What? And, but, but, but by right, I should have been given, by law, I should have been given a ticket. But by grace, God gives you and me grace every day. Don't you get it twisted. Did you forget to pray this morning when you got up? Don't tell me. Don't raise your hand. Don't tell me. Shame on you. But the fact that you're still breathing, grace. Did you mess up doing any time this week? From last Sunday to this Sunday. Now let me see your hands. Anybody ever mess up? I got both of my hands up. You, you told a little lie, a little white lie. You, you went through a red light. You weren't kind to your spouse. You weren't kind to your children. You were mad because they said, oh, I got a report due tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. It's midnight. And you go into H-E-B at midnight to get a poster to do that project, and you mad, and you ah! And then you get home, then you got to do the thing. And now you go to bed at 2 a.m. You feel in a certain kind of way. You ready to read them the right act and chew them up, and they just sit there go, I'm sorry, Mom. And you get grace. Grace. 
God gives all of us grace, y'all. Listen, I'm done. Somebody give God praise in the house. Know this. Know this. Your life in this building today, the fact that you are sitting up and not on a ventilator, the fact that you are sitting up and you are listening with your own ears, you are watching me with your own eyes, you are appreciating the sermon. You are, I, I, I prayed for you. I asked that the Holy Spirit would be here this morning to help anybody who's here today and those who are streaming us to hear and understand. Because God fixed it for us. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he, he, he gives us a promise. His promise is all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called. You are called. You are called. Everyone in this room has been called. Did you get the text? Did you get the phone call? He called you to be his children. He called you to love him. He called you to obey him. And some of us didn't answer the call. And we're going to go back just like we walked in. Some of us answered the call, but we're only going to answer partially because we don't want to really be devoted to God because it's too much work. It, it, I got scheduled things to do. And then there's the third group is I'm sold out. And I'll go to church. I'll do ministry. I'll help others as much as I have to because of what he's done for me. He, he, extended, he extended grace. Listen, let me give you an offer. We'll be done. And, and I'm going to give you an invitation. Don't you like invitations to parties and stuff? Well, here's an invitation. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, and maybe you grew up going to church, but you never really understood, and you never believed. If that's you today, and you want to accept Jesus, you want to know for sure that if you die tonight, you're going to go to heaven. If you want to know for sure, just stand up where you are so I can pray for you. You say, I think I'm going. I'm pretty sure, but I messed up so much, I'm not sure. Well, that was me. And I used to sit way in the back because I was too embarrassed. And I didn't understand. So when they asked the question, I kind of raised my hand a little bit. So my question to you is, if you're not sure and you want to know today before you leave here that you're going to go to heaven, just stand up where you are or go to one of these counselors on the wall and say, I want you to pray for me to accept Jesus into my heart. Secondly, if you're here today and you don't have a church home, you don't go anywhere on a regular basis where the word of God is being preached to make it make sense for you. And you'd like to join this church. Just go to one of these counselors right now. Just stand where you are. Walk over to one of those counselors. Say, I want to join Skybridge Church, and I want to get involved in ministry, making a difference. Or, or maybe you're going through a difficult patch in your life, a difficult time, and you need prayer. Just go to one of these counselors. I'm giving you a lot of invitations this morning. Nobody's taking up on it. Uh, and I need some this morning. And tell them what you want them to know, as much as little as you want them to know. Because God is calling us to a higher level than we've been, y'all. We can't keep doing the same thing and expect things to get better if we don't change. So if that's hey, while the music plays, make a change right now. Make a difference. Make a difference. Where are you this morning? Oh, to Jesus, I surrender. you I see you God bless you God bless you is there another is there another God bless you 
It's time for us to celebrate our holy communion. There are two sacraments of the church that we recognize, one being holy communion. If you do not have the cup of wine and the bread, raise your hand so that we can serve you. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. If you have the cup with you, won't you stand with us as we celebrate Holy Communion? In the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, number 11, verse number 23, it reads like this. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he passed it amongst his disciples. And he says, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take this and eat all of it. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. God bless you. Take this and drink all of it. <laughs> 